are uh, people of faith, but also, in a way, um, how obedience can affect our relationships with those around us and vice versa. Um, obedience is not a word we necessarily like to hear, but of course it comes from the Latin meaning to listen. And if we are engaged with one another, if we are listening to one another, uh, I think that is the key in which we can continue to stay grounded, but we can also then um, be in, com in community with one another, um, taking on ideas from outside and giving our own ideas to others. Phyllis last night was talking about uh, how we're moving from uh, the age of reason and um, post-reformation, which was so individualistic, into the emergence church, which is talking more about community and communal. And the only way to live in community is to listen to one another. And then conversatio is um, conversion of a life. It's really everything else in our lives. It's the humility, it's the prayer, it's the balance, it's the silence. It's all that that allows us to take on board what we're experiencing and see how we are drawn, can be drawn closer to God in the conversion of our own life and our own practices. So as a practical matter, I just want to leave you with, with perhaps some ways to, uh, uh, to carry this out. One, um, as has been said before, would be the practice of the daily office, the divine office, the liturgy, the hours, um, morning or an evening prayer. There are many ways to do this. Uh, as Sister Donald said, the, the Anglican tradition is, comes out of this Benedictine spirituality and this Benedictine um, rhythm of prayer. Find a church that does the daily office. There are churches around here in the Diocese of Washington that um, you can be part of a community that says the daily office every day. If you don't want to be in community, that's, that's fine. You can just find um, the format in the Book of Prayer. You can find it online. You can find any sort of aid um, to help you with uh, an office that, is, that speaks to you. Um, you can find a place in your own home. Uh, if you're at work, you can turn on the computer and do the daily office perhaps before you start work. There are all sorts of ways that you can uh, carve out time for the daily office. One of my practices in the morning is to, uh, to walk and while walking, meditate and having that um, time just to draw within yourself and clear whatever may be going on in, in other parts of your life. But just spend some time with yourself. And obviously walking is a great way not only to get physical ex exercise, but also then to um, get some oxygen to the brain so that you can, can meditate. And one of the other things I do on a daily basis in the afternoon is um, shut the door to my office and um, just meditate for 15 or 20 minutes. Let the phone ring, uh, no interruptions, just reflect on the day. Um, see where God has broken in in that particular day um, and get ready for the rest of the day that uh, may yet to come and all the opportunities that God may present for us. Those are daily practices. Weekly practices, obviously, uh, worshiping uh, in community. Um, that's so important, especially more if we're moving into this emergence uh, of um, uh, Christianity, uh, the importance of community in doing that. As Abbot James talked about, uh, Lexio Divina, or I also include Visio Divina, um, sitting with an icon or some other piece of art and seeing how God speaks to you through that. That doesn't have to be a, just once a week, it can be much more than that. But engagement with, uh, with the scriptures, uh, reading the scriptures every day, more than just maybe what we hear in the daily office, but really going more deeply to see how God may be, be speaking to us. Um, having the opportunity for spiritual companionship, or spiritual direction, a prayer partner, um, at least on a, on a weekly basis. And being part of, um, of a Benedictine cell. And as uh, Sister Donald said, there are a number of uh, Benedictine groups here in the greater Washington area that uh, meet either weekly or monthly, and it's a way to, uh, to reinforce, to get that little booster shot of Benedictine spirituality uh, and keep you uh, accountable to one another um, on, on the way of 
St. Benedict. And then, of course, um, annual practices, I can't um, commend highly enough an annual retreat. Um, and I especially commend the Benedictine experiences, um, where I, mean, I went to one where I first met Sister Donald, oh, it was eight years ago now? That's incredible. I got to sit at her feet and, and soak up the wisdom that, that she had to offer. Um, the one in Collegeville is obviously uh, very rich. I know a number of people have been here, uh, who are here today, have been to that, and it certainly helped me think about what, um, what today's program will be all about. On the back of your uh, Orange programs, there's a listing of the upcoming Benedictine experiences if you're interested, and um, anyone on the premises of St. Benedict Fork and, and those who have attended can talk to you more about that. But it's that, I think for me, the, the annual retreat is that booster shot as I was talking about, that really uh, puts everything back in rhythm and in balance, and especially in science. It's so easy in the midst of our whirlwinds to move away from that, and I find that having an annual retreat like a Benedictine experience then gives me the tools I need to go back into my whirlwinds and uh, uh, experience deeper spirituality and also the presence of God in my life, but especially focusing on the silence where nothing resembles God so much and where God's speech is silence. Thank you. Great, many thanks to our three panelists. Uh, you've all been challenging, very generous with your thoughts and insights and set the stage for the discussions that we'll have from here. Um, I see that she's come, so I want to ask her to repeat something. Sometimes we repeat this in the Benedictine rhythms, which is the round of applause for St. Catherine Held and her generosity with the food last night and today. She's here. This happened, happened before you got here, so it was sort of wasted, but um, anyway. Now for the next part of the morning, um, the conversation shifts to you, and um, we're going to go till about 12 noon. Um, our panelists are going to sort of circulate and listen in a little bit, see how you are reacting to their words, and you can, if you want to, ask them to join a part of your conversation, or you can ask them a question of clarification or something, or you can just continue your own conversation and they'll listen in and learn from you and, and move on. Um, I want to pose three questions that you can talk about, but if there's something that is more important to you, something you'd rather talk about, don't let this direction interfere with it. The first question would be, where is the spiritual oxygen? Where is your spiritual oxygen? And then, maybe more importantly, how do you protect it? How do you make that something that isn't always subject to being compromised, cut into? Why is it that there are so many forces that seem to conspire to rob us of that spiritual oxygen or to mix it up with pollutants of one kind or another? So the spiritual oxygen question would be the first one. The second question I think that could be fruitfully pursued at the tables would be the one of community. Um, I've always loved and thought it was fascinating this this phenomenon that Abbot James brought up of, um, well, the best thing about monastic life is the community, and the worst thing of monastic life is this community. And it was one of the things that struck me early on when I became interested in Benedictinism, that like the workplace, or like the parish church, or like the neighborhood, where we don't actually select and vet everybody that we're going to be with, um, the monastery is a place you might show up and it would have its full component of bullies and incompetence 
people that you find difficult, people whose backgrounds make no sense to you, or whose views are antithetical to those that you hold, how do you live with them? And why is that such an important spiritual exercise to try to do so? So I think that any reflections and experiences and insights you might have on this most profound spiritual exercise of community, the curse and the blessing, um, that would be a fruitful area for bringing your experiences and insights to together. And then the final question, if you would like it, would be this one of the whirlwind is actually the place that something might be happening with God, uh, with the transcendent, with our own evolution as people. Um, and that the whirlwind isn't going to go away. Um, I think Phyllis Tickle last night made us convinced of that. It's not going to go away. Um, and maybe it shouldn't go away. If we have the example of Dorothy Day living her life um, in a very prayerful way, but also throwing herself into the kind of work she did, that tells us something. And it is, it is interesting and not an accident that you know, we're told in the wonderful book of Job of God speaking out of the whirlwind or the Elijah thing. So the whirlwind is incredibly challenging. It seems to take us away from our solitude and our peace of mind. And yet, in one story after another, it seems to be the place where we do experience a path to God or we do hear something that we wouldn't hear if we had sealed ourselves off. So that, that interesting question uh, in that, and I think that that might be a place also to address or think about this paradox of we want the stability and the monastery promises us the stability, but then this, this, this radical openness of constant conversion that demands that we receive the new over and over and over again um, as, we're, as we're protecting the old. So those would be three things. Um, but you may have better things and things that are more important to you, and if that's the case, that's what you should be talking about. Um, I want to ask you to do one thing table by table, um, and I hope this won't be awkward, which is that someone step forward to do the service of being a facilitator. So this doesn't need to be the smartest person in, this, in the group or the bossiest person in the group or anything like that. It really is a service. And the role of the facilitator would just be to help you settle in the first five minutes on the question or the issue you'd like to talk about. Um, and then to kind of protect the space so that everybody gets a chance to bring what they've got to bring um, to the discussion. So, uh, that would be, and there's no, we're not going to be reporting back your conversation with one another is its own value um, and, and it's its own outcome. So nobody has to do a, a, a summary uh, at the end unless that's something you want to do. So please, the first, the first thing would be for somebody to either volunteer or be volunteered uh, <laughs> as, a, as a facilitator, uh, understanding that that's a role to accept in uh, true Benedictine humility. Um, we're not going to have a formal coffee break, but all of that is over there. So as you feel a need, just drift over and do that continuously. And we will um, come back together um, in in plenary at, uh, at 12 noon. Uh, now, are there any questions of clarification before we move to that that you want to ask any of the, you'll have another shot at them at the very end, but if there's anything that's with you that feels really pressing right now that you want to clarify um, with, with any of the three speakers. Everybody's okay? Okay, so the focus shifts to you. Thank you again for our panel.